For this week's Look at Employment Law in our Toil and Trouble slot, I'm joined by Shelley Eden, Director of Shelley Eden Law. She joins me to talk about things to consider when starting redundancies, things that many public service bosses will be hopefully considering as well at the moment. Um, this comes on the back of all these job losses in the public service. That's right, and look, it's such a tough time for so many people, and, and I think it extends beyond the public service. I have many clients who are looking at restructurings and redundancies. It's been happening for a little while now. It's very likely to pick up steam. So, like, it's a topic that, you know, probably no one really particularly wants to talk about or we talk about a lot, but actually there's some niggly little things in there that employers can get wrong and that's really important to focus on and try and get right. So I guess um, just chopping a number of people, um, if you get your processes right, is one thing, but it's when roles have to be reworked into other roles, isn't it, that the complication comes? That, that's exactly right. And so most... You know, employers will focus on the putting together of the proposal and the rationale for the change and starting that process. And, you know, they are good at that a lot of the time. Uh, not always, but a lot of the time. It's when we get to the kind of the sharp end of it, where you're actually going, well, no, this role is changing. It, and it's a significant change. It's a genuinely a role that's going to be made redundant. So now this is a great opportunity for me to get some fresh blood in or to get rid of that person who actually I don't like that much or who isn't performing. And so you start to get this blurring sometimes of the lines between a genuine restructuring process and actually sort of a targeted endeavour to get rid of somebody. Um, in terms of a role that is created, so someone gets cut and their role morphs into something different, does it have to be fulfilled by existing staff? So in principle, so there's a really helpful case that came out, and it's actually quite old now, it's from 2010, it's a case called Wang, and it established the principle that if you are changing a job, significant enough that it is genuinely a redundancy, it's a new role. So for instance, in that case, a role was being changed from a particular level to a more senior level, a more strategic level, and that's not uncommon. That happens quite, you know, happens in my experience quite a lot. So Mr Wang had stepped up into that role previously while the manager was on holiday, but now he wasn't offered that role in the restructuring. And the point that the courts made in that case was to say, if someone, if it's a new role, but someone could do the role, even perhaps with a little bit of training or support, then they must be offered it. And that's a, a change. You know, that was a change in 2010. And it's taken a while to filter through that actually you can't just say, right, every, you know, you have to all reapply for your roles or we're going to open it up to external candidates. The law actually says, no, if I'm sitting there kind of doing three quarters of that job or at least half of it and it's changing and I could do the new job you actually have to re redeploy me straight into it so I don't even have to I mean I obviously have to want to do that but I don't have to like apply or go through an, an interview process or a recruitment process it's my it's effect effectively stays my job. I mean, you often hear of companies asking everyone to reapply for their jobs. Is that actually illegal? So it, I think it depends on what's happening. It's really common to ask for an expression of interest, um, and that's probably a better way of saying it. And that could happen perhaps, say, when there's, maybe there's two of us that have a job, and there's going to be one job mm -hmm. afterwards, and we both actually might be interested in it. So our employer can't redeploy us either of us, directly into that job. It'll have to go through a process. But before doing that, we'll ask us you know, to apply or to give an expression of interest. And for instance, in that case, I might say, well, I don't want it. You know, if, and then they would redeploy you directly into it. But again, it's starting with internal staff, and I think that's the bit that people miss. So you start with the person whose job it was, and it's now new, and and it may be that that person simply gets redeployed into the new role. Or if it's more complex than now there's different roles and different people, then you would do that expression of interest process, see who you can slot comfortably into the new roles, perhaps go through a process with some people if, if it's you know competitive between them, and then it's only when you've done all of that that if there are residual roles left over that you can um, apply you know ask people to apply from external from outside of the organization Sorry. what what's the situation when you're redeploying someone into a role that's less senior so it's the same it's the same thing so you're still looking at a role that the person could do obviously they don't need the training and they can simply be offered that role it's quite interesting because it can get complex or it can get kind of a bit difficult because the person could on the one hand be insulted where you're like you're telling me I can now do this much more junior role that I did 10 years ago or actually um, upset that you didn't give them the chance for it so the right. thing to do really is to say look this is the new role it is more junior than your role but of course if you would like it we would love you to do it here are the pay you know 
know, conditions and so forth. And again, if that person says, yeah, no, I'll, I'll do that, then the employer, if they don't, they're risking a personal grievance for an unjustified dismissal. Um, and what about if the person's role um, is, is more junior and pays more junior and they, they ask, is there a case for the employee to ask to be paid at the same Right. They can certainly ask and they can certainly negotiate. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's often not from a position of strength, especially if the reasons for the restructuring, as they so often these days, are financial. Then, you know, the very reason probably why the employer is making the role more junior may be to trim costs. But, but in principle, there's no reason why you can't say, look, I'll do that job, but that, that salary's not, you know, come on, guys, mm. I'm going to bring a lot to this role. You should pay me a bit more and just negotiate it. If they reject that, are they eligible for redundancy? So that's going to depend. It's a really good question. That is going to depend on the terms of the contract and the terms of any redundancy policy. So the wording of those can be quite variable. So often, if you are offered a commensurate job on the same conditions and you turn it down, then sometimes you won't be entitled to redundancy compensation. Um, if it's a different job, then you might be. It's going to depend on the wording of the policy. It's important at, in the early stages for employers to check the wordings of contracts and the policy wordings. And of course for employees who are being affected by this and there are a lot of them to also check their own situations you know their own contracts um, sometimes employers will take the approach that if someone says no they will give them their compensation kind of regardless that's sort of relying on their generosity and it, it absolutely happens um, but it's a question of the contract that you've agreed to which unfortunately you agreed to when you signed up and you may not be sure what it says now mm -hmm. but it's important to review it and if you don't understand it to take some advice on it. And does everyone become eligible for some sort of redundancy or are there some contracts where people are not allowed any redundancy? There's a lot of contracts without redundancy compensation in New Zealand. Um, it didn't used to be the case, um, but the modern contract quite often will just say in the case of redundancy there's no compensation. So the employees will still be entitled to notice of their redundancy, which they might be required to work, or they might be paid out if they leave early. Um, but it's, again, it's a question of the contract. There's no legal obligation in New Zealand to provide redundancy compensation, unlike, say, Australia. And so quite often, and this is the sort of tragedy of it all is quite often people leave with very little. Just finally, what are some things that employers need to consider? I mean, often redundancy can be so bruising for people. Does it need to be that way? I, you know, I've seen a lot. I've, I've worked through the GFC in 2008, like I've worked through, you know, now what's going on now and COVID and all of that. And it is brutal. And I think the most brutal thing is actually... It's like someone breaking up with you, like you, and you didn't do anything wrong. You know, your employer doesn't love you anymore and doesn't want you anymore, and you did nothing to deserve it usually. Um, and if you did, they shouldn't be following that process. So, so it's very, very upsetting. It can be a huge shock. Like people go through grief and loss, and and are so upset. Um, you know, they should be avoided at all costs, in my view, if you want to retain sort of a stable and balanced and happy workforce, because of course it affects your other staff as well who aren't made redundant. If it's unavoidable, like we see happening now, it just has to be done with care and concern for people and try and help them through this you know, great thing that's happening in their lives. Um, you can offer, e like, EAP counselling. You can offer career counselling. Like, there are things that can be done. And if it's done in a humane and caring and, like, genuinely, genuinely trying to get a good answer away, I think employees respond to that. It's when they just get a form letter that shows no care for them and they feel like they're just in this box-ticking exercise, you know, to get them out the door that I think people have the most problem with. If you treat people like, you know, decently like humans and try and do it as kindly and as caringly as you possibly can you still will get some really upset people but you can make it easy for them I mean it's just a really tough time for every everyone and the people doing carrying out the process are not enjoying it either it's just a kind of a miserable thing unfortunately and so you just got to do it with as much care and respect as you can. Shelley thank you so much for coming in. Thank you it's a pleasure. For more content just like this and all the latest business and political news head over to mbr.co.nz.